Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 103 of Buds and Blue Jays, your place for all things related to the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm your host, Jesse Burrell. And as usual, I'm joined by my normal co-host, Riley McConnell. And Riley, after getting swept by Baltimore to end our homestand, the Blue Jays marched into the trop where nothing ever good happens at that place. And we proceeded to, well, not play that well. Surprise, surprise. Tampa wins three out of the four games here, meaning the Blue Jays only get one victory and a lot went wrong in this series. We'll talk about it all in this episode, including if it's time to make a change behind the bench or maybe we should let the GM go. And what is going on with Alec Manoa? Is Yusei Kikuchi back to the guy he was last year and so much more. But first, before we get into it, guys, remember our show is free and are available on all platforms. So please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and anywhere you can get your podcasts. You can find Buds and Blue Jays. So please, we're rapidly growing on that side. Like, share, tell a friend, all that good stuff. Riley, enough of the formalities. Let's just get right into it here. True or false, answer this. The Toronto Blue Jays are going to be a playoff team in 2023. Oh, I can't comment on that now, Jesse. That's crazy. If you want my answer for the show, I got to say yes. true. But if so, if something doesn't change, it's absolutely false. Like if this if this trend continues, it's false. But my optimistic self says true. I think the actual answer is true as well. This team is too talented, but boy, the talented players on this team really do need to start playing like the talented players they are. For reference, Riley, we are now into game 50 of the season. So we're about, what, a third of the way there, just a little under a third. The Blue Jays have gone six and four the first 10 games, followed by six and four their next 10 games. And you can guess where this is going, week three and week four. They also went six and four. And in their most recent 10 games, so that's a 600 winning percentage, Riley. That will play. That'll get you into the playoffs. But the last week, Riley, the Blue Jays just went two and eight over their last 10 games. In fact, they've now lost 13 of their last 15 games against the AL East opponents. And when we look at it with we're playing that division less this year, those games matter so much more. And the fact that we're losing a significant portion of them, Riley, really means the Blue Jays are going to have to play real, real well for the rest of the season here in order to get into the playoffs. It bites, Jesse. It really mm-hmm. bites. I've said this forever, and I even read you, like, a, not a quote, but a statistic before the show. The AL East is just significantly better than all other divisions in baseball, and it really isn't even close. So the fact of the matter is we could be a top six team, seven team in the American League right now, even without things changing too much. But to really compete the way the formats are set up, Like we need to be able to beat teams in our own division. It's always been that way. That part will never change. It doesn't matter who you play in the regular season. We're, I know we're in the regular season now. Our brains are telling us with this lineup, we should be a playoff team. So we try and look down the road. And right now, down the road still doesn't look good because we are not playing well against teams like the Baltimore Orioles, teams like the Tampa Bay Rays. So it's, it really stings when, yeah, we get swept by Baltimore. And then, of course, we go down to the trop and lose three out of four. Like, that's never good. We need to lock it down, especially against teams in our own division. There's just too many holes in the Blue Jays game right now. So we need to address those. We need to – something needs to happen. Or my statement of, yeah, are the Blue Jays a playoff team? False is if nothing happens. But something's totally got to change for this team to really be a playoff team, which – I believe they are a playoff team, but something has to happen. Vibes are not good right now in the Toronto Blue Jays land after very disappointing plays. Let's get into the game recaps here, just in case you weren't watching so we can fill you in on what happened here. Game one of this series, the Blue Jays lost this game six to four and Chris Bassett's shutout streak was ruined when the Rays scored three in the bottom of the second. Rays jumped out to a four nothing lead. The Blue Jays were able to get two back thanks to a Whit Merrifield home run. But that was all the offense they would score until the ninth as ultimately they made a bid for a comeback, fell just a little bit short. Uh, In game two of this series, the Blue Jays went on an offensive onslaught. They end up scoring 20 runs against the Tampa Bay Rays, winning this game 20 to one. They got a lead early thanks to a George Springer home run. And in fact, several Blue Jays went deep, including several off of position players. I think Vladimir Guerrero Jr. had a grand slam. Danny Jansen and Matt Chapman all had home runs in this game. Jose Barrios actually put together a very nice start in this one, going seven innings pitch, five hits, one earned run, two walk 
walks, five strikeouts. Very good start for him. And the Blue Jays cruised to a rather easier victory here. But it was all downhill from here. In game three of this series, the Blue Jays gave up a run in the first, followed by two more in the second. As you say, Kikuchi gave up several home runs in this start and ultimately lost seven to three. Didn't really play that well on defense either in this game. And in game four, the game that happened this afternoon, it was Alec Manoa's turn and Alec Manoa struggled yet again, issuing a season high. I believe it was, yeah, five walks and six strikeouts over his three innings pitch with four earned runs allowed. The bullpen did a pretty good job behind him, but it was too little too late as the Blue Jays comeback fell a little short, Riley. So after this series, Blue Jays have a record of 26 and 25. We are 10 and a half games back in the division now, and we aren't even in a wild card spot. We're three games out of the final wild card spot with, I think, Boston, the Angels, and Seattle all ahead of us in the uh, standings there. So, yeah, things are not looking good, Riley. And I ask you this because last time the Blue Jays were in a really big funk early last year, we made a change at manager. So I think I've got to ask the question here. Are the Blue Jays going to make a change behind the bench? I know that Blue Jays Twitter went off their rocker when John Schneider made that move to pull, uh, well, do that mound visit. John oh, Schneider in the was last kind series. of on the hook yeah. for that. And you could even, yeah, it, but I'm saying, so that's where the ball gets rolling and you kind of gets in your head and everyone's calling for his head. Everyone, oh, put Mattingly there, put Mattingly there. I mean, Listen, we're 50 games into the schedule. We are a third of the way there. That's a significant part of this ball season. And starting hot early on is so important, but there's still a lot of ball left to play. And the fact that we are 500, our season could go either way, Jesse. We're certainly, well, at this point, you can you can pretty much plainly say we are probably not a 100 team or 100 win team yeah, this that's year. Goodbye. That's That's fine. But are we an 88, 89, 90 win team? It's not out of the question, but something has to change. I personally, Jesse, I I would more like to say, like, it's not on the front office, but let's see something change. It's not on John. It's not all on John Schneider. Mm -hmm. It's a lot on the players underperforming. It and it, it sucks to say it's through and through the lineup. Just you're getting different and mixed results from a lot of different guys. We'll get into that more, of course. But I don't want to call for John Schneider's head myself. I would like to see maybe some changes happen with this roster and some big ones. I'm not saying sell the top prospect or the second top prospect but let's bring try and bring someone in that can shake things up in this lineup because i think a change is is needed we're a team that if you told me at the start of this year we're going to be 500 you know around one third the season i actually wouldn't be too too concerned but if you were to tell me that the rest of our division jesse was <laughs> was going to do what they were going to do then i would be concerned because 500 ball at this point in the season isn't terrible it's not ideal but it's not it's not the worst thing that could happen but we have to match our division if we want to compete we got to compete with the best it's not we're not talking the best the best in the american league is the american league east mm -hmm. it's it's a proven thing right now i mean the numbers don't lie and i mean i think that i don't want schneider to go but I would like to see the front office make a move. And if not, if and then if we start to falter more, then we got to like switch things up because at some point it's going to be too late. Let's not let that too late happen. So remember last year in the season here when Hunjin Ryu went down with his injury, Ross Stripling came into the rotation. And when he did, the Blue Jays really started to go. We got on a run. I think you and I said in the offseason, Ross Stripling kind of saved our season, right? Ross Stripling isn't here anymore. He's not going to be doing that. But the Blue Jays need some sort of player to come in and to just literally light a spark under this team. Now, now, teams in the past have done this by firing their manager, and I think I'm with you. Even if we did fire John Schneider and Don Mattingly took over as the coach, I don't think this team really changes much. Don Mattingly has been there, you know. For what it's worth, the Blue Jays won a lot when John Schneider took under the realm last, just last year, so I don't think that's a real issue as well. But I do want to bring up one point here, Riley. After the game, after the series on Sunday here that we lost, or Thursday, that we lost at the Trop, the Blue Jays held a players-only meeting, right? And... 
teams that are struggling do this. We saw them have a hitters only meeting earlier at the end of the Baltimore series. Now they had a full on team meeting and Hazel May, who's really good at her job, went and asked Matt Chapman, Hey, is there anything you could share with us about what the players discussed in that meeting? And Matt Chapman went and replied with, I'm not even sure how you guys even knew that happened. And then it said he'd like to keep all the issues within the team. Turns out John Schneider himself, the manager in the post game press conference actually was the one who said the players had a team meeting. So it almost feels like maybe John Schneider, I don't want to put words in their mouth here because I'm sure there's a lot of stuff going on, but doesn't it feel that if Matt Chapman's best wishes are to keep things with the team and John Schneider's out here telling the press everything that's going on with the team, do you think he's losing the locker room at all? And if he is losing the locker room, then maybe you do have to make a change. I mean, so we've, Jesse, we've gone in a huge, we've already, like, from where we are, to, from what we talked about last season, at this very point in the year, we are a completely different manager. We're a completely different lineup. Our pitchers are different. There's a lot of small changes made. There's a lot of big changes made. Um, if we're, if he's lost the locker room, then we we got a whole other discussion because I mean he's still a fresh manager in his in his MLB career. He doesn't have 162 games under his belt yet. I mean, like, is it on the players? Is it on the managers? Or is it on the front office? I'm not one, and I'll always have the play. I never want to blame the players for the character clause things. Mm-hmm. I would like to think that all the blue jeans and everyone chips in that way. But is there an underlying underlying problem? Like, I'm not really sure. That's what it's starting to sound like. I like how Chapman, you know, keeps the comments to a minimal. Is is John Schneider losing his clubhouse? I mean, that's a tough question because it, I mean, look, you can hide a lot of things, you know, on the field, but behind closed doors, we don't know what's said. We don't know what goes on. We're not the reporters there. We just look at what's on the field. So we can speculate all we want, Jesse. But as far as I'm concerned, I mean, he's got to have some sort of a grasp on things. I mean, and if he's losing it, then he's lost it. I would say over the course of the last two, three series, and we're just not seeing it because that's uh, things must have just trended downhill in the locker room or whatever. Not trying to speculate, just trying to draw ideas, trying to figure this all out like the rest of us. So I think I agree with you, Riley. I do think it is on the players. And if you've been watching the Toronto Blue Jays this year, it has been the players who are not performing. And let's get into a few of them that really let the Blue Jays down in this series. And I want to start with Alec Manoa, Riley. Because we talked a lot. I think after his last start, Isaac was on the episode and he's like, I want to bet on the track record of Alec Manoa. Like, I really want to do it. And I was kind of saying like, man, the stuff just looks awful. And if you look at where he ranks among 72 MLB qualified starting pitchers, like his 553 ERA, fifth worst in baseball, his 1.79 whip, the worst, his 6.37 walks for nine, the worst. He throws over 19 pitches an inning, the worst in baseball. Like there are numbers that say Alec Manoa might be the literal worst starting pitcher in the big league so far this season. And even in the game today, Tampa Bay stole five bags against him. So he's taking a long time. He's not controlling the running game. He's walking guys like I don't see anything in the numbers, Riley, that really make me feel like Alec Manoa is going to turn this around. And on top of that, too, like I like he's got to be hurt, right? Like he has to be. There's no way a guy just loses his stuff like this without some type of injury or something's going on. I don't know, man. Do you have any thoughts on Alec Manoa here or what it's going to take to turn him around? I mean, I would I don't know if it's physical or not. Look, he's a big body dude and it's not like I mean three innings in the in the six three loss i mean that's not a big heavy workload i don't know how many pitches he's thrown but i mean he's been limited on what i mean he's limited on what he can throw because he hasn't been throwing really and the word i'm looking for is competitive pitches Mm -hmm. i mean you can be off jesse and you can throw you know competitive pitches that are missing i think bassett is one of those guys that can has been for us probably has the most close called ball strike kind of thing but alec manoa and I'm, I mean, probably has the most like well outside the zone pitches. Like there's your nine squares of um, your batter's box. If you want to look at it on from a TV, you got your inside, outside, low, away, middle of the plate, whatever you want to call it. Then there's four zones outside of that. I mean, he's not even hitting those zones. He's not even hitting the outside of the zones. He's making very uncompetitive pitches. And it showed today with five walks. And this isn't the first time. I mean, five walks is a lot. 
but we've seen four walks. We've seen three walks. There hasn't been too many one walk games or zero walk games for that matter. Um, so, I mean, he's just, he's not making competitive pitches. I don't know. It's got to be a little bit of both physical and psyche. I mean, he's a guy who pitches on emotion and maybe he's being too hard on himself. Maybe he didn't get off to the start. He wanted to, and now all of a sudden he's crumbling at the knees with, with you know, what's in his head and things like that. Because, yeah, the runners on base thing was ridiculous. I mean, he's not even – I don't know what his numbers are on with runners on base, but they certainly got a heck of a lot worse after that outing, man, because that's – you can't – that just can't happen in that short of a time period, Jesse. I know the Rays are a pretty quick-footed bunch, but I mean that those starts with Manoa just cannot happen. Yeah, Alec Manoa. If you look at his pitch chart today, he didn't throw a single changeup over the plate for a strike. His slider, I thought, was his best pitch. He got five swings and whiffs on that, which was promising to see. At least that's what I thought. But Alec Manoa threw his sinker a lot. He threw more sinkers above the strike zone than he threw in the strike zone, and that, especially for a sinker. That is not going to work. In fact, he only threw two sinkers at the bottom of the strike zone. And until Alec Manoa can fix that command and fix the delivery, we're not going to have a guy here. I don't know what the next step is. Like, there's no one in Buffalo who's really ramped up and ready to go. Like, I think we have to find a way either to phantom IL him or just give him a breather or something because the Blue Jays need, need, need Alec Manoa to come back to the guy he was if we're ever going to get out of this route. Uh, one, any quick thoughts on Manoa before we move on to another struggling pitcher in the series? No, we better just move on to the next one, Jesse. Probably. I think that I, I hope we don't. T- I think I hope we don't have to talk, have this talk about Manoa every damn time he takes the bump. But I mean, with the trends, Jesse, they just don't look good. All right, let's talk about the pitcher then who got this first start in this series, and that is Yusei Kikuchi. He was coming off a bad start the series before. We wanted to see him bounce back, and you know he didn't in this series. It was. Not a great start for Kikuchi, who had some quite underwhelming stuff. Gave up eight hits and two walks over five innings. And his season line, Riley, now sits with an ERA over five. His FIP is just shy of six. And he now actually has negative 0.1 war on the season. That won't do. The walks are better than they were in the year past, because that was the thing that really hurt Yusei Kikuchi last year. But he is still giving up hard contact. In fact, he's giving up the most hard contact on the Toronto Blue Jays. He gave up two more solo home runs in this one. And it's just... Hey, I know he's our fifth starter, and I know we had a good spring training, and I know he had a good first month of the season, but it seems like Yusei Kikuchi is probably going to be this guy, this up, this down, and when it goes bad for Kikuchi like it did in this start, it could be really bad, and it's just, again, it's more starting pitching problems, and I don't know how far this team is going to go with Yusei Kikuchi getting regular turns in the rotation. I mean, certainly, you'd never really want to give up eight hits in an outing that's under, you know, seven innings. It's not great. The walks do look good. I will say this about you, say Kikuchi. You want to talk about a guy I have more confidence in. I couldn't be more north-south than talk about a guy like Manoa from last year to this year. I have Quite a quite a bit more confidence in Yusei Kikuchi when he's taken the bump in this 2023 campaign, man. I tell you, he's looked real good in a lot of occasions, but it's just it's all of a sudden. I mean, he's I mean, he's a good he's a left handed pitcher with great velocity. But all of a sudden, Jesse, whoops, that pitch is missing its spot and it's getting hit 415 feet over the left center field wall. That's the problem is the hard contact and getting hit. Like the location seems to be better, like a lot better, but sometimes the location could get a little careless and you're just kind of leaving stuff out of the, over the heart of the plate on, you know, really non-competitive breaking pitches. And it happens. Hey man, you can slip up, but he's, Slipped up a little too much in this one. So in a way, I mean, it's it was bad, Jesse. And still, when you say Kikuchi takes the hill, the next time he goes out and pitches, I I I probably and I think, yeah, you say Kikuchi's taking the hill, and I've seen some bright spots in this. Let's make this a good quality start, you say, and let's pick it up because I don't think his season line. I hope not. It could read around five ERA. But it could be a healthy five ERA in a way, Jesse, for a five a starter. A healthy five ERA. I, it, when well, not not when you get three runs of support, it isn't. But there are hey, there's been MLB starting pitchers. There was a guy uh, who was he for us? Uh, well, he got the 
oh, Chris Carpenter, one year yeah. in the early 2000s, had a terrible ERA and I think finished with a positive record. I could be completely wrong, but he could be one of those guys. Our run support wasn't there for him. I mean, he did give a, a bundle of them, five to be exact. But I still I still could see the up and downs, but I still think there is. I'm Jesse. I'm with you on that one. The, the Yusei Kikuchi train, I'm really trying to climb aboard fully. And, I mean, he has looked good. This wasn't his outing, but I am pumped for his next start. I do think he'll have a better start. You know, I don't understand, especially because there's nobody in Buffalo that is really knocking on the door to getting a start here with the team. Why haven't the Blue Jays gone out and tried to sign a guy like Madison Baumgartner, who has let go from Arizona about a month ago at this point? Like, why haven't they gone to try one of these guys just to get a guy who can throw quality innings? Like, we have a spot in the rotation you can put him. I also have a thought, Riley, and uh, this might go on with one of our thumbs up because Trevor Richards is really good and Nate Pearson were both good in this series. Why don't the Blue Jays try to go back to like an opener, if you will? Trevor Richards has done this in the past. Nate Pearson has been a starter in the past. Get these guys out. See if they can go two to three innings. And then you follow with a Yusei Kikuchi coming in after the pen. And I really want the Blue Jays to try something like that in their next uh, in their next series. Um, I doubt it'll happen as they're probably just going to run with Kikuchi and keep on a normal turn until they can figure it out. But I want them to try something, Riley, and that's my idea. Well, that's such a very innovative thing to say. Uh, in my head, I shut that right down. No openers for me. We just go for starting pitchers. If you can go nine, you can go nine. If it's a safe situation after eight and you've thrown over 80 pitches, you bring in your setup guy. Case closed. Mm. But, hey, listen, I have no problem with using – uh, you know, variations in it. I mean, in Manoa's start, he got he he got the hook. Let's talk about, I mean, I, I know we're skipping over a thumbs down, but let's just kind of mix things together because we'll talk about Richards for a second, who also had three innings on his line and had a perfect line. Did not surrender a base runner, Jesse. That is a huge positive. I mm -hmm. mean, you're coming into the ball game basically cleaning up a mess. This is a... Basically a mop-up role for Trevor Richards, where if he gets a three-run home run hit off him, no one cares. Because at that, like, yes, the game will be out of reach at that point, but he held it together very, very well. Also racked up three strikeouts. This is the probably the only time on this show. This might be the bravo, the highlight of this. Like, is I don't think I've said anything good about Trevor Richards on this, you know, since our whatever episode. It could have been, this could be the first time I've ever said anything good about Trevor Richards. But yeah, <laughs> like when things aren't rolling good, you got to go with who's hot. And I mean, hell of an outing for Trevor Richards. It's uh, relief pitchers don't go three innings anymore, it seems. But yes, you're right, Jesse. He was an opener. Not that I want to see him as an opener, but is he a guy who can handle more leverage? Maybe. Or is he just a guy in the clutch when the run differential just doesn't matter? I don't know. But it's just it's a, another bright spot because Manoa was terrible. Richards came into the game and was great. And it kind of keeps the fans engaged. It keeps the players engaged. Like not all is lost, even though we lost a game, but we didn't know that at the time, but it held us in the ball game, Jesse. Mm -hmm. And that is still very important. And that's the thing, right? We can talk about, Hey, Trevor Richards is now one of our best relievers right now. Maybe we should get him into higher leverage situations, but we've seen Trevor Richards in high leverage situations in the past and it did not go well. And let Riley, you hit the hammer on the head. There is value in a guy who can come in, throw you three innings, give up no runs and keep your offense a chance in the game. And if that's what Trevor Richards is good at right now, if he's not going to be an opener, I say, leave him right in that spot. Riley, I want to talk about, about a good performance because it's a lot of negative in Blue Jays land right now, but there was a good one. And that is the performance that Jose Barrios had in this start here. He went seven innings pitch. He went five hits, one earned run, two walks, five strikeouts. And Riley, if you look at it over his last, I believe five starts now, um, he has his last eight starts, sorry, 50 innings pitch, 288 ERA, a 1.1 whip, a 4.1 K per walk ratio. He, and in this start today, he only had four hard hit balls against him and zero barrels, Riley, a Tampa Bay Rays hitter who have the best offense in baseball, didn't barrel up a single baseball against Jose Barrios today. Riley, is it safe to say Jose Barrios is back to the guy we thought we were getting here? Because this start gave a lot of promise. I mean, do not ever say it's safe to say that Jose Brios <laughs> yes, is we've fully, learned by fully back. <laughs> but the one promise, the one promising promising thing, if anything, Jesse, is that hard contact. But 
As far as Barrios' line goes and what happened in his start, I mean, hey, it's easy to pick up the win when the team gets 20 runs. Let's mm-hmm. be honest. But still, when Brios goes seven innings, you kind of guess at what his line might be. Did he walk four or five guys? Like how, like how many balls hit over 375 feet were caught at the warning track? Like, I mean, he struck out five. He gave up five hits. He walked a couple. So what? I mean, he gave us a chance. He kept us in the game. If this was a if this was a one run ball game, he still kept us in the game. It just happened to be an absolute, like you said, onslaught. And I mean, he still gave a heck of an outing. He missed barrels. He got he upset the timing of the Rays hitters, and it ultimately yes, the twenty runs won us the ball game. But I believe if we don't score twenty runs and it's a close game, that Brio still walks out of there with the win because he put up one hell of a start. Yeah, I'd probably put him as our third best pitcher right now behind Bassett and Kevin Gosman, and that's just fine for Jose Brios. I think if we got that coming into the season, it'll do just good. You mentioned the offensive onslaught, Riley. I don't have much else to add. The Blue Jays scored 20 runs in this game. Nine of them came off Brooks Raley, including home runs from Vlad Chapman and Danny Jansen, all off the position player. But it was the fourth most runs in team history. There are 27 hits they got in the game, second most in team history. And yeah, just kind of cool. Quick thought on that before we move on to one more thing. I mean, hey, it's good to talk about all that stuff. I mean, six RBIs for Vladdy. That's, I mean, Grand Slam, whatever. It's it's a good, it's a good stat pattern, is what it is. And I don't mind, I don't mind those, man. I wanted to point out that um, as crazy as that game was, Matt Chapman was the only Toronto Blue Jay to draw a walk in that game. That's one of my big takeaways. Oddly enough, dude, the only Blue Jay to draw a walk was Matt Chapman. Um, RBIs all over the place. It seems to be out of guys like Jansen, Varsho. Those ones, those guys had three Chapman, three himself, and then Vladdy, of course, driving in six. So it was kind of like a, you know, for the big getting your, you know, big triple crown categories in like RBIs, which I do love very much. You know, there's only a few guys contributing on that, but yeah. 20 runs. You said about nine against the position players. Whatever. I have a whole other thought on that. Manage the game. If if you throw if you throw a seven year old kid in there, that's your decision to do that. And yeah. those players has, have every right. And I hey, I can sit here because the Blue Jays scored how many runs against them. I wouldn't be griping though if it's like oh a Rosa Reina hit a had a had a grand slam when they were up by you know 16 runs like that's baseball man yep. you should never let up agreed. to your opponents man agreed, like agreed. that's just i it's i whole other thing hey i i would i would just not talk about it if i was i would just bury my head like holy crap we just lost by 19 runs if it was on the blue jay side that's all i got for the uh 20 to 1 game jesse yeah makes sense um we do have some injury updates santiago espinal was officially placed on the il and after Otto lopez spent a day with the team they sent him down ernie clement was actually called up and he had been raking in triple a buffalo ops over 900 he actually got a hit in his first game with the toronto blue jays so i'm excited to see more what ernie clement can do and uh I, I think we're going to see more of that coming forward. Thomas Hatch had been sent to AAA. Mitch White had been transferred to the 60-day IL as Adam Simber had returned to the roster. And the last one, Riley, I bring this up. Danny Jansen was removed from game two due to left groin tightness. Taylor Heineman has been put on the taxi squad as Danny Jansen isn't officially put on the IL yet. But I bring this up because this means we're going to see more of Alejandro Kirk now. And we've talked about it before in the episode in the past. Alejandro Kirk has been quite bad. He's been moved down to seventh in the order. And I know he had three hits in the series finale today, but none of them were hit extremely hard. In fact, he's lost four miles per hour on exit velocity and his average launch angle is down seven degrees. Those are not small numbers. Those are very significant numbers. And uh, Fangraphs just wrote an article trying to break down what was going on with Alejandro Kirk. And I'll, I'll snip out this paragraph of what they said. And His real issue have been pitches down low in the zone. So this is where pitchers seem to be attacking him. Last year, he was getting just enough loft to hit those balls into line drives or to get something out of him. He hit 452 on low fastballs last year. This season, there have only been three of 13 low fastballs that have not been driven into the ground. And Kirk has lost about eight degrees of launch angle on average compared to those pitches. And it's not just luck either. He's hitting them with less velocity, resulting in an expected batting average of just 231 on those pitches as opposed to 336 last year. So Tampa Bay has got the best offense in baseball because them as a team 
have collectively rose their launch angle. They are hitting the ball in the air because balls hit in the air tend to produce better results than balls hit on the ground. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is hitting ground balls more than ever. Alejandro Kirk is hitting more ground balls more than ever. And I don't think it's an accident that these players are struggling. So do you have a thought about the Jansen injury and Kirk playing more and what it means for the team going forward? Well, first of all, good for, I'm going to touch on, good for Ernie Clement. Yep, That's uh, not an Oakland A, one of my Oakland A's guys, but was there for a hot minute. I think he was more Cleveland Guardians type-esque guy. But, um, dude, just when Danny Jansen, just when you want to rub your hands together and go, ooh, it's, stuff's about to get hot, is when he gets taken out due to injury. We've seen this happen. Danny Jansen never play, has played a real full year in MLB, and he's probably still as streaky as he is, one of the more underrated players in all of Major League Baseball. And, yeah, I mean, Kirk's got to put it together. He was an all-star last year. And... I mean, there's just the bat just seems to be almost completely different at times. I remember a Kirk that was really good at hitting balls to the alley, you know, take looking at pitches kind of just above the belt and either taking them to right center field or pulling the ball. I mean, hitting almost to all fields because he is very, very good at putting bat on ball, but it's about hard contact, Jesse. I think that's the moral. Launch angle is one thing. I think that's a secondary behind getting good wood on a ball. Of course, Jesse, if you're just putting pop-ups into left field, yeah, that won't do. driving <laughs> the ball up the middle. We want to, we want to have guys driving the ball up the middle before we're, we gotta, we gotta walk before we can run Jesse. Let's just get some solid contact out of Kirk. I know that like the eyes, great. The bat on ball skills is great, but we got to put more of it together in order for him to, I mean, really put together a successful season. I don't think – I think we're going to have a setback as far as statistics goes for Mr. Kirk when we look back at this year. But there's still time to, to, to turn this around. There's no doubt about it. I'm optimistic about it. And, heck, he's going to get a lot more playing time, Jesse. So let's see that happen sooner rather than later. Yes, that's the thing. The Blue Jays need to take their slumping players and turn it around very, very soon. Remember, guys, that'll do it for our episode here today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please like the video. Subscribe to the channel on your way out and hopefully we have some more stuff to talk about tell us what your thoughts are down below in the comments tell us if you think the blue jay should fire john schneider are you worried about alejandro kirk alec manoa or yusei kikuchi do you think the blue jays are going to be a playoff team let riley and i know down there we'll reply to you and get back riley anything else to add before we call an episode here today no going against the twins man and um i'm already thinking about that series Big things got to happen or big things are going to happen off the field in mm. order for us to secure some wins coming up. We're not in trouble yet, Jesse, but big series against the Twins. All right. I hope so, man. We'll see you guys later next week.